Right, well, last paper of the day, and I'll try and make it quick. Um, as we've been hearing today, wetland archaeology in Scotland has focused almost exclusively on the Crannel, an island usually artificially constructed with structures on top. Their occupation spans nearly two millennia, and it's long been recognised that the use of the generic label Crannel implies a sort of commonality of form and function that probably obscures um, their particular relationships with the, the um, settlement context in which they should be viewed. The work of the um, SWAP, the Southwest uh, Southwest Scotland, no, Scottish Wetland Archaeology Programme, over the past decade in Southwest Scotland, um, at Whitefield Lock, Lock Arthur, and you've heard about Colts Lock this uh, earlier today, has gone some way to demonstrating the um, variability in construction, in morphology, and location that's subsumed with the, under the uh, Crannog label. Um, and the focus of my talk this afternoon is our most recent excavations, which is a site called the Black Lock of Merton um, in the mappers of southwest Scotland. A site which is um, challenging even further our, our perceptions or our preconceptions of what wetland settlement is in Scotland. The Black Lock has been referred to as a crown since the 19th century when the landowner carried out an investigation of one of the mounds in a boggy area of his estate. Um, the 19th century uh, map in the, on the left there shows the Black Lock as a body of water, but it's now um, fully drained, and the location of the site is um, the Red Star. And we, in 2013, we surveyed the area between the two um, main drainage channels. The farmer had started redigging them to uh, drain fields to, to the site, site. And we've identified up to um, eight mounds, which are the pink blobs in the survey area. And we've now partially excavated two of those mounds. The, the excavations have demonstrated that the mat, both mounds are roundhouses and the both have been built directly onto the peat. So this is not a Cranog in the classic sense uh, because there is no artificial um, foundation to the settlement. We've been calling it a lockside settlement, a lock village almost in homage to uh, Glastonbury, which is, as you've just heard, the only other lock village on the British Isles. But we've also been calling it a lock village because we assumed that it was built on the peat that was gradually, on the side of the, you know, the peat that was gradually <coughs> filling in that shallow lock. But this uh, summer, a team led by from Southampton University, led by um, Tony Brown, has carried out an extensive program of quarry to model the extent and depth of the original lock. And what this appears to be showing is that the settlement lies on a low PT promontory, projecting out into the lock and connected to the shore by a wide natural causeway. And this work was only done in July, so unfortunately I don't have any plans to show you, and I hope I'm going to get this right. Um, the the I think the causeway you reckon is down here, um, Tony. And so we, there's probably a shallow lock lying to the west, north, and uh, uh, south, uh, east of the site. Um, what the depth of the lock was, we don't know until um, Tony carries out his analysis. But it could well have been very shallow. It could have just been marshy by the time this um, site was um, settled. So is this a proto cranog building on a, a natural promontory? The next step being to um, build. You know, um, on to create an artificial island, or is this a discrete site type which is being built in parallel with other classic crannogs? So these are questions that I'm going to return to after I've um, presented the, the physical evidence. As I said, we've um, now partially excavated two of the mounds. Structure one, um, which is where all the trenches are laid out in 2013, and structure two in uh, July of this year, and that is that blog just there. The um, results of the 2013 season are now fully processed, we've done all the post-excavation, and so a lot of what I present today rests on the results of that season. What the excavations have demonstrated is that each of these mounds consists of a massive uh, stone hearth complex at the centre of a timber roundhouse, and this plan shows the primary hearth in structure one. Um, this is the this, you can see here, the sort of cobbles of the primary hearth. <coughs> the foundation deposits, they laid down very large um, stone slabs to form a foundation for the hearths, and around this, um, a, lot, a surface of huge logs laid directly down onto the peat. And extending out from this central platform was a radial structure of alder timbers, again laid directly onto the peat, and you can just about see um, bundles of branchwood which have been laid across the, uh, the radial structure. 
the evidence for the superstructure of the house consists of an inner post ring and two outer state lines. One of the questions that we've been uh, talking about is whether there's been adaptation um, to the particular locations in which they were being built. And all the posts on the postering had this very unusual design, not um, sharpened tips, but the lower ends are concave as though designed to rest on the horizontal logs. We'll come back to them. Um, the two stake lines of the out which form the outer wall, you can see them defined by um, garden tags in the foreground. They lay about uh, half a metre apart. The mound at the centre of the structure had been created by the construction of three massive stone hearts, one on top of each other. Each consisted of a mound of loose cobbles contained within a curb of very, very large boulders, and the surfaces were either um, clay on the bottom one and uh, massive uh, slabs on the upper two. The half complex eventually stood over one metre high, and as you can see over time, um, the weight um, caused it to sink or rather the peak to compact underneath it. And this is presumably why it um, was rebuilt um, twice. And I think you can see in the section um, above the, the peaks sort of dipping down. And this is the final half. And so you, you can see the sort of absolute massive nature of the structure. Even before the post-excavation program, it was clear that there was a very pronounced asymmetry in the construction around the circuit of the house with very different types of surface, stones around one side, timbers around the other, um, all of which suggest spatial <coughs> organisation, um, distinct activity areas, um, and this has been borne out by the post excavation analyses. We've undertaken analysis of the macro plant, insect remains, and soil thin sections, and what these show is that there are very um, different uh, distinctions between the occupation deposits in the southwest of the half house and the northeast. We have sedges and rushes used in one part, grasses and leaves in the other. Um, we've only got um, half debris and domestic debris sprilled in the um, southern part of the house. Um, the northeast looks very clean, and the artifacts are also only found in the, um, the, the southern part of the house. <coughs> Structure two, um, excavated this year, only lies a few metres um, to the east of uh, Structure one. And it has displayed many of the uh, features that we've observed in structure one that are much, much better preserved. What seems to be happening is that there's a decay trajectory from uh, west to east across the site, which I hope is uh, visible in, the, uh, in this section, in this photograph. The uh, diggers are actually working on immediately on top of the peak surface. And as you can see, by the time you get down to the foreground, it's dipping down and you can see how much, how better preserved the uh, wattle of brushwood is in that area. <coughs> The house is very similar in size. It was a, the structure one was 11.7 metres in diameter. This one is uh, 12 uh, metres. We have the, a double um, stake line. This shows the inner stake line um, uh, removed. And like the comments that um, Richard made, you can see that the stakes are not inserted very, they're, they're quite small, and they're not inserted very uh, far into the, the, um, the ground. In structure one, we had speculated that one stake ring might be a replacement of the other, and we weren't able to demonstrate this with a dendro. But having seen the same feature in structure two now, we're beginning to think that this is, um, you know, it is a design um, feature. We've also got the inner post ring. Um, I don't know if you can see posts here and at all the junctions around here. And again, all of these posts, all of them were oak, and they all display those concave bases. None of them have the, the sharpened uh, tips. Again, in structure one, we had speculated that they might be part of a movable screen because we only had two of them. But here, where we've excavated a quarter of the site, they clearly form part of the, the superstructure of the house, and they must presumably be an adaptation to you know, building on these soft foundations. I mentioned the evidence for spatial division in structure one. These tangential timbers that you can see here, um, around here, would have created... Um, no, move back to it. They would have created very um, substantial divisions between the inner area around the half, which you can see down in the corner here, and the outer periphery. They were jointed around the uprights. Uh, I think you can see in here they've been carved quite crudely, but jointed nonetheless to sit around the uprights. And um, th in this, which is the best preserved example, you can see that we've got the stake holes for an internal screen. So those tangential timbers were, in fact, a, a silby. What has also survived in much better condition here in structure two are the floor levels, the brushwood and the woven screens used as subfloors, 
with thick deposits of leaf litter over them. And although this looks like it might be a collapsed screen, possibly the one from those internal divisions, it is in fact a subfloor of a sort of a loosely woven branch wood. And the wadge of material in the corner just here, which is, um, is uh, a great big deposit of uh, plant litter, which has been left in situ and which was lying over that, uh, that floor. And structure two is also dominated by a huge half mound. The water levels here prevented us from uh, getting to the base of the mound, but there were probably at least four hearths in this stack, all built in similar fashion to those in structure one. Um, and you're looking at one, uh, one of the later structures with the, the big hearth slab um, in the top corner. And in the bottom here, you can see the, the timber framework within which the hearth was uh, constructed. As with structure one, um, the weight of these hearths clearly compressed the, um, the peak below, and so the floor levels around them had to be constantly rebuilt. And the, the, the hearth lies to the left of this photograph, and what you can see is the primary brushwood floor lying directly on the peak at the bottom. Uh, you can see a, a big wadge of um, compressed plant litter flooring uh, just here, another brushwood floor being put in, another wadge of plant litter, and finally they start using inorganic materials to cre create the floor surfaces. And dates. Um, we had one radiocarbon date from an older post within the uh, post ring, which gave us a general date within the first millennium, bang in the middle of the house shaft plateau. But luckily we have been able to dendro date uh, some of the plants, um, oak plants, and these show um, felling between 461 and 429 BC. And I don't know if there's pizza in the audience. As part of his PhD, he's also done wiggle match dating of those great big foundation um, timbers that you saw earlier. And this indicates construction sometime between 510 and 435 BC. So I think we can be fairly confident that structure one, at least, was built in the middle centuries of the 5th century BC. And these dates make... Uh, Black lot virtually contemporary with the cults lot three. You saw this bar diagram earlier. The oaks there were felled between 438 and uh, 412 BC. And this issue of contemporaneity is critical when we come to consider the nature of the settlement at Black Lock. It could be, as I said, it could be viewed as a, a proto cranog a settlement built out into the water <laughs> but using a natural PT promontory. But if it was built at the same time as cults lot, which as we've seen, is more of a classic cranog, it's got the artificial foundations, then this must surely, Blacklock must surely represent another settlement variant, but one that also required being surrounded by water, living out on the water. So why? It comes to, hopefully I can get this in at the very end. As I said, living out on this uh, PT promontory requires structural adaptations, such as the concave um, base uh, posts. Subsidence was clearly a problem, forcing the rebuilding of the hearth several times, needing the le levelling up the floors and laying down very thick layers of plant litter for insulation because it must have been very damp and very uncomfortable at times. All the kinds of conditions that we've just heard of um, at Glastonbury as well. Uh, Graham mentioned seasonal occupation and that's certainly a, a possibility, one that we haven't been able to demonstrate yet. But even so, if you think back to those hearths, this is a lot of effort to go to for what's in effect a summer house or a bothy. If you think about some of those stones, I mean, to lift one of the slabs this summer, it took something like five people to just move it to the side of the site. And this all had to be brought onto the, the site. So it's a huge effort just to go and live out there for the summer. And the other issue of Black Lock is that as at Cults Lock 3, uh, built in a very small lock, the builders could simply have built an earth fast roundhouse on more stable dry foundations on the slopes of the lock. They didn't need to go out there. So if the occupants represented perhaps a different socio-economic strata of society, we might expect maybe to see differences in their material remains, in their equipment, their diet and their structures. But apart from the location, and I have thought about calling this location, 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 there is little to distinguish the settlement at Black Lock <coughs> from other contemporary settlements <coughs> in the area. Um, the roundhouses are no different to their dry land equivalents, um, in plan at least. Um, if we compare, for example, the um, site at Block, Black at Cox Lock 5, which you saw earlier, a roundhouse, the ring groove representing the stake lines, an internal post ring, and again this um, house at Risbane Camp, um, only a few miles away from Black Lock, both of them roughly contemporary. Um, 
they're similar in size as well, so uh, very, you know, we couldn't see any difference in plan. The, the material culture in southwest Scotland in the later prehistoric period is generally very poor, and in that respect, the artifact and eco fact assemblages from Blacklock differ very little from those of other dryland sites in the region. It's dominated by an assemblage of uh, core stone tools and quern. It's not very exciting at all. Um, there's uh, evidence for agriculture in the form of the iron R chair tip, which is a little bit more interesting. And we have evidence from the uh, macro plants that the cereal crops were being uh, both processed and consumed on site. Barley and Emma spelt and bread club meat. The only item that we found this summer, which is, is unusual, is the little um, clay plum pot down in the corner. And this is the first um, ceramic artifact to be found in southwest Scotland. Um, this area is generally considered a ceramic during this period. But in fact, this, that artifact in some ways um, you know, reflects the conundrum that we've got. Does this, does this plum pot make the site different? Um, from the dryland sites, or is this just one? Is it just an issue of preservation? And I think this is a big problem when we come to you know, compare um, uh, the two types, the different types of site. So we've we um, have rehearsed the functional explanations for living out on the water more at Cult's Lock than here so far. But in fact, the same arguments <coughs> apply. One of the the main arguments given is defence. Um, this, uh, this is the only AP we've got at the site at the moment, and it's the little red star at the very top. But you can see the, the size of the lock. This is the damp ground here. So this, the lock probably only comes out to around here. It's a very small lock. Um, we've, not, we've not found any evidence for a defensive perimeter around the site yet. We may do, and they may have considered that just being out on this little promontory surrounded by marshes was defense enough, um, maybe. One of the other reasons for building uh, Cranogs has been to free up land on the shore for cultivation. But as you can see, Black Lock and Cults Lock 2 lay in areas, big areas of cultivable land. Building a settlement wasn't really going to make that much impact on what was available. Um, transport routes, uh, we heard from the Garonne that the Iron Age people are living because it was a you know, communications and a commercial axis. But that's really, you can't really apply that to these little kettle hole locks. Maybe with the larger locks, um, you know, further north, uh, Loch Tay, Loch Hall, that could be an argument, but not down here. And then there's access to resources, which um, you know, uh, Richard has outlined at Glastonbury. But again, you can walk around these locks in an hour. You know, so you could set out by boat you know, to do your fishing and fowling, you could sort of crop your reeds from the, the shores. There's no reason, obvious reason, practical reason to build you know, out in the middle. So none of these arguments make, for us make sense in terms of settlement in shallow locks. We think, we think that it's, we have to look at less tangible motives, perhaps, perhaps originating in the belief systems and or the social order of the community, which placed significance on the water body as a locus for settlement and other activities. Water and watery context seem to have been particularly venerated in later prehistory attested to by the votive deposition of metalwork and human body parts. And we've heard from uh, Peniel in Denmark uh, today, I found that very exciting, that you know, they have the Iron Age settlers um, sort of merging the sacred and the profane, as you said. And Graham has also speculated that Cranogs could be seen as domesticating what was thought of as a ritually charged environment, combining the, the spiritual and practical spheres of life. There are lots of issues with this interpretation. I feel very uncomfortable with it, not least of all because it's um, untestable. Um, so I'd maybe leave that to the discussion. Um, but I, so I just, in fact, I'll skip on over that one. Um, I just wanted to leave you with this. <coughs> you know, uh, Richard has said that the Glastonbury Lock Village is unique in England at the moment. And as a lock village in Scotland, Black Lock currently represents an entirely new site type. But it's certainly not unique. I think they just haven't been recognised until now. And we've just done a very brief review of the antiquarian literature. And this reveals this example at Dowerton Lock, which is only a few miles away from the Black Lock. It contains numerous classic uh, cranogs. It also contains um, uh, metalwork deposition. And it has this scatter of um, stony mounds on the east shore. And you, I've put down the quote from the antiquarian, Lord Levain, who excavated there. And he recognised them as single dwellings. And I think that we're looking at another, another Black Lock there. Unfortunately, that's a site that has been um, uh, drain, so we're unlikely to get the um, preservation that we got at the Black Lock. 
And finally, thank you to all the people who have made this work um, possible so far. Thank you. <laughs>